you. And this is what you, what you come with. Well, what do you come in with? What do you log on with this morning? Well, whatever it is for you, I want you to know that there's good news. I want you to know that we all come to the same Lord who has the same words of hope, assurance, and encouragement for each of us. You see, last week we made the choice to choose Christ and his chains. Well, today as we continue in this sermon series, Elements of Happiness, we mix in the second element of perseverance. Turning to the end of Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. Paul says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whenever I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. It's through this word this morning, these written words from Paul from in jail, that Paul says, whatever happens, stand firm and persevere. The second element is perseverance. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks and praise for your Holy Spirit in this place and all places. We pray, God, that your spirit will remain in the mighty ways your word is given and received. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, again, this book of Philippians is the first letter to the church of Philippi. It's a short, precise letter. It can be read easily, quickly. It's only four chapters. And so if you go back and reread it or read it for the first time, you'll see that it's a very heartfelt letter that emphasizes joy. Some scholars might say gladness, but the majority use the word happiness. And again, this is not just happiness in the moment, a happiness that is fleeting, a happiness that's dependent upon uh, the praise band leading us in powerful, meaningful, wonderful music or crystal leading us in a powerful spoken word. No, it's a lifelong sustained happiness. The lifelong presence of God in our lives, throughout our lives, yes, the entirety of our lives, and then also every aspect of our lives. No, it's just not in only the wonderful times, but also in the times of struggle. Scholars would use the word confidence, not, not arrogance, but a, but a disposition rooted in the love and the truth of God. Amen? You see, as believers, we have this joy, this this happiness, because we know, or at least are, are growing to know more fully, that the struggles and the difficulties and problems of life do not mean that God has caused them upon us, that God has uh, imposed them upon us, or that God has deserted them while we are in the midst of them. No, to the contrary, our Lord Jesus says in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You see, the one that has overcome the world is the source of our joy. It's where our joy comes from. Our Lord, his power, his presence with us. Yes, enabling us, empowering us to overcome fear, to walk, as the psalmist says, to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We see it's this same Lord uh, that is with Paul, that sustains Paul, compelling Paul to say to the, to the Philippians then and to us this morning, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whenever I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm. You see here, Paul's writing about his his desire to go and visit the church of Philippi, which would have brought them joy. But they all know 
it's uncertain. It's not guaranteed because of Paul's situation and that he's facing death. And so his primary concern is to say, whatever happens, whether I come to you or not, he knows that they can stand firm and stand for who they are. Yes, he wants them to be, he wants them to be able to be faithful whether he is with them or not. And as a pastor, I can relate. The late Dr. Fred Craddock says, for their own health and maturity, they must stand, not lean. The Christian life is not a game of hide and seek with the minister. Paul's presence or absence is not the determining factor in their living out the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, for our own, for your own health and maturity, the only one that we can stand on is the one that we lean on, Jesus. And we do the leaning by dying to ourselves every day like Paul, choosing to live for Christ, trusting in him. Yes, how do we do this? How do we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel? Well, we put our whole trust in his grace as we vow to do when we profess faith in Christ. Putting our whole trust in that prevenient grace that's ever-present, everlasting, always with us, wooing us unto God, to love God more, to appreciate God, to understand that God was already loving us long before we first knew God. And then in that moment when we do come to know God and we profess faith in Christ, where we are justified before God, seen as innocent, righteous, blameless, as if we were Christ. From that moment on, we trust in God's sanctifying grace as the Spirit pours upon us the power and presence of God so that we grow to actually become and live like Christ. Well, this becomes a delicate dance with the Holy Spirit because in our trust, we are, to commun or we are to commit to and participate in the means of grace. Those works of piety, right? Growing in our love for God, leading to personal holiness, worshiping God, connecting with the people of God, growing through prayer and reading God's word. Yes, that grows us in our love for God and it leads to from personal to social holiness through those works of mercy, loving neighbor, visiting those in prison, caring for the sick, clothing the naked, giving drink to the thirsty, food to the hungry, collectively us advocating for God's justice, for God's kingdom to be revealed in us and in our community. Yes, are you trusting in his grace? to grow you, and then also when we fall short, to forgive you. Yes, has your trust in Jesus persevered? Has your, Jesus, or your trust in Jesus persevered? And how do, we, how do we ensure we have persevering trust? Well, to me, one of the ways that helps us and assures us of this is in our prayer life, our prayer life. And so pray whatever's on your heart, frustrations, laments. You can use whatever words. God is big enough to hear it and to receive it. This past week, I was reminded of Psalm 19. It was one of the devotions in the disciplines uh, booklet that I've asked some of you to, to walk with me daily. Well, that devotion, uh, I was reminded of my love for Psalm 19. Uh, I was born on July 19th. My mom was 19 years old when she had me. I was baptized on my 19th birthday. My favorite psalm is Psalm 19. It talks about the beauty and marvel of God's creation and then also the beauty and marvel of God's words. And then the devotion, she encouraged us that sometimes we can just sit there silently in prayer, trusting that the same God that creates and causes the sun to rise is the same God that can speak to and work on us even in the silence. That all we have to say sometimes is, dear God, and amen. Jesus himself said, God knows what you need before you even ask, Matthew 6, 8. We also, of course, can trust God in the times where we fill the silence with words. And again, I'll lift up to you the facts prayer, whether or not you use that in each time you pray or just throughout your prayer life. We come to God in faith, Believe in God exists, that God is 
hearing us and will answer us. We adore God, lifting up our praise and, and worship God. I love you, Lord. You, you are good. You are gracious. You are giving. You are a good God. See, confess. Lord, I confess, though I recognize you as good and holy, I fail. I fall. I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess this particular sin. I confess I need your grace. I need a Lord and Savior. T, Lord, thank you. Thank you for initiating your grace. Thank you for salvation and restoration and, and redemption. And thank you for where that leads me in my relationship with you and one another. Those that I lift up in supplications, the S, intercession, praying for ourselves, our family, our church family, community, and the world. Those are the facts. But the fact is, the more we pray, the more trust we have in God, and the more God trusts in us. You see, this is what I call prayerful action and active prayer. Prayer is uh, prayer should lead us, to, it, it encourages us, it compels us, empowers action from us together, together. And so that's why Paul says, whether I come and see you or, or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. You see here Paul saying, in order for you to conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, in order to have persevering trust, you need, you have to have, you have to stand firm in the one spirit, striving together, persevering together. You see, it's, it's life-giving to be in relationship with, to interact with other Christian believers, to fellowship with one another. You see, Paul has already mentioned this back up in verse 5. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Where well, this word is koinonia, and it translates to participation, and also communion, community, fellowship. An important word for us Christians. Important word, concept, spiritual discipline. That's why many churches have a what? A fellowship hall, Right? It's essential. And so we're working on some fall festival events to get us to fellowship together. It's essential to what it means to choose to live out this Christian faith alongside and with other Christian believers. And it's important how we see those others. You see, koinonia istes means a fellowship of equality. And so this is key to the gospel that Paul preaches from the time that he was set on his mission and journey, no matter where he ended up, who he was teaching and preaching, koinonia estes was an important part of the gospel. You see, it means to have redemption and restoration and reconciliation with God and others. And so it's important how we see the others. Yes, Paul calls us to see others the way that God does, understanding, knowing, embracing that there is no longer Greek or Jew. There is no longer male or female. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer black, brown, or white. You see, there is, there is no longer gay or straight. There is no longer Democrat or Republican. We are all created by the same God, redeemed by the same Jesus, sustained by the same Spirit. I'm going to take that as an amen. And if we recognize we all have this same source, creator, redeemer, sustainer, it should compel us as we are called into redemptive relationships, fellowship, having a deeper love and connection for each other through God's grace and as God's grace. Yes, we experience God as we live and breathe and preserve together as a community of faith. That's why it's one of our mission strategies. We worship, connect, and care for each other, you see? With these elements of happiness, having a deep abiding joy and happiness in our lives, yes, persevering depends on and is cultivated by koinonia, community. And so we're expected to see each other, 
but in a particular way. You see, this is important to Paul. This is important to, to me, that we see each other as, and the best way that we can illustrate to define this is to see each other as the other self. You see, for Christ calls us to love one another as we love, love our neighbors as ourselves. He calls us to love our enemies as ourselves. And so this is that same kind of notion, right? To see each other as the other self. I mean, will we inflict harm upon one another if they were our other self? No, of course not. We would live with a profound preposition, with, with. You see, Paul uses with throughout Philippians over and over and over and over again. We live together with each other. We persevere together with each other. You've heard me talk about my covenant group, uh, six other pastors, one of which we've been lifelong friends since we were at seven years old, Demo Farley. My other close uh, friend, my accountability partner, Erwin Lopez, he and I were in Lakeland together at the same time. And then when I was appointed to St. Luke's in Orlando, that's when he was appointed as the UCF Wesley Foundation Director. So he is our Methodist pastor on that campus. And so over the years, Erwin and I have become super close. We talk usually daily, if not two, three times a day. Well, he and I, the whole covenant group, we pray together, but there's also times where we're invited for those prayers to become active prayer. This was uh, years ago, uh, he and his wife, and at the time, only child, they have two now, they were on vacation when they received word that a pipe burst in their home and their home was flooding, and the main room that was damaged was the baby's room. Well, two, three days later, they put out, it was late in the evening, about seven o'clock or so, we were getting ready to do dinner, and one of us noticed a Facebook post that they were looking for help right then for people to come to the house and help salvage whatever that could be salvaged because the truck was coming to pick all that stuff up. We looked at each other, even though it's Orlando, <laughs> same city, it was a 30-minute drive across 408 Toll Road, but we looked at each other and said, this is important. This is important. So we drove, picked up something to eat. There was a handful of people, and so we worked for the next two, three hours, however long it was. They were grateful, of course. As we're leaving, I realized every person that was there to help them was from ministry, from their church, or simply Christians us being the body of Christ for one another. Our own Committee on Inclusiveness recently did this, receiving word that a woman was returning home, uh, which a home that had been an abusive situation. The abuser had put two holes in the walls using her, even went back to draw on the wall to make fun of her. Our Inclusiveness Committee, some of them went, repaired the wall, painted over the nonsense so she could return home and that it would be a safe haven and not a reminder of. We live together with each other. We persevere together with each other. Eventually, the home was renovated and it came out even better, you see? We find happiness together with each other, living life with Christ, the source of our joy and happiness. This is what Paul taught, this is what he preached, this is what he's encouraging in the letter. Well, it's also something that he believed to his core and lived it. You see, that's why he could be, he could be in chains up against a wall uh, in a makeshift cell, no air condition, possibly raw sewage flowing by, and that he can still say, I rejoice. He still rejoices in the Lord. Two things. One, knowing his chains were advancing the gospel for folks like the Philippians, and also knowing that they were prayerfully supporting him, which he points out in chapter four. You see, being in chains for Christ means being in chains for one another, trusting them to be there for us and ours while we are there for them and their struggles, knowing that both, all of it, is the presence and the strength of God with us to get through. And so Paul says, yes, yes, it has been granted to you on the behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had. He's facing death, he's in jail, he's facing false teachers and, and opposition. 
Well, we may not be facing that same struggle as Paul or the Philippians, but we all do go through, we all are going through the same struggle of trying to remain faithful to the gospel while persevering in life. I want you to know, friends, that a life of faith, of course, does not mean or equate to or or become an easy, struggle-free, pain-free, crisis-free life. No, we see this in the story of God's people, right? Think about Moses and the Israelites. Did he need perseverance to get through the desert for 40 years? Yes. And nowadays we'd also say a map or GPS or stop and ask someone for directions. Perseverance to get through the desert times. And it's a perseverance with presence, right? You see, the powerful thing about the Exodus story is that God is with them in the desert, in the wondering, in the uncertainty. The number 40 means, it means 40, and it also means a time of completion. And so God was completing in Moses, the Israelites, preparing them for the next generation of stepping into the promised land. Yes, God was with them when manna came every day consistently and faithfully. God was with them when water came out of a rock. Yes, God was with them in the presence and the power of the tabernacle. Yes, God was with them through the desert, perseverance with presence. We see this in stories of history. You probably know Thomas Edison went through what they say, 9,999 failed attempts at making the light bulb. Did you know that he took over 50,000 attempts to get the battery right? Perseverance. Apparently, Sylvester Stallone was turned down over a thousand times by all kind of agents and movie studios for Rocky. He had $600 left, and finally a studio picked up Rocky, which he wrote and, of course, catapulted his career. Don't give up. Perseverance. They say it took Winston Churchill three years to complete the equivalent of eighth grade, where years later, Oxford University asked him to give the commencement speech. The story goes that he arrived with cigar in mouth, hat on cane. He approaches the podium to thunderous applause. He silences the crowd, removes the cigar, puts it on the podium along with the hat, gazed at them and said, never give up. He was silent for a few seconds. He rose to his toes, leaned on the podium and repeated, never give up. The thunder in his voice was followed by sheer silence. Grabbed his hat, his cigar, and walked off. Never give up perseverance. We're almost there, folks. I had a lot to say. Even our founder, the Methodist movement, John Wesley, in his journal, he wrote, Sunday morning, May 5th, priest at St. Anne's was asked not to come back anymore. That afternoon, priest at St. Andrew's was asked not to return. Sunday evening, priest at St. John's, the deacon said, get out and stay out. The next Sunday, May 12th, priest at St. Jude's, can't go back there either. That evening, priest at St. George's, kicked out again. Sunday morning, May 19th, at, I preached at St. Somebody Else's, deacons called a special meeting, uh, said, and they said, I could not return. That evening, priest on the street, kicked off the street. Let's try one more time, another week, May 26th. I preached in the meadow. I was chased out of the meadow by a bull who was turned loose during the service. (laughs) Sunday morning, June 2nd, I preached out at the edge of town, kicked off the highway. The afternoon, June 2nd, I preached in a pasture. 10,000 people came out to hear about the love and grace of Jesus Christ. John Wesley, our founder, a persistent man who persevered. Yes, we see the balance of struggle and perseverance in scripture, in history, in our own Methodist movement, and we also see it in nature. And I'm not talking about jungles or safaris, I'm talking about my own backyard. Past Monday, I rolled out of bed, started to go to the back porch about 7.45 7.45 with some coffee to do some reading, praying. And sitting there swimming in our pool was a baby possum. Just swimming, 
enjoying the day, enjoying the morning. Thank you, Lord, for your new mercies. And so he was just kept circling the edge. And so I went to get the boys. They came out. We were like, wow, baby possum. Well, I had noticed that he had stopped on the holes of the sweeper at one point, and they kept swimming. But when I came back out with the boys, he or she was sitting there out of the water, and I could tell, oh, they're tired. That's why they keep circling the edge. They was, he was looking for a way to get out. And so we, were, we, we put on our capes. We got to rescue the possum. I go get the, the net. I extended it all the way out. When I, when I first went to get him, he kind of hissed and it showed his teeth. And then he went into the little trap where the pump pulls the water, right? Came out about a minute later. I was like, okay, we have to do this. I scooped him up, and in that moment, all that courage I encouraged you all to have week, last week, I didn't have. I quickly dropped the net and ran. I didn't know if the water was making him look smaller than what he really was, or I, I didn't know if he was going to attack. Didn't know if he was going to come say thank you, didn't do either, didn't run away. You know what this joker did? This joker played possum. And then thinking we didn't see him, her, walked off real slowly. Well, I wonder where he or she gets it from. I know. One, our creator was created that way. And then also resurrection. They thought, some thought that he also played dead. You see, God's persistent love is the model of perseverance. Coming in the flesh, Jesus Christ, love incarnate. He persevered in and through this human life. Yes, persevering through temptation, opposition, and ultimately even through death. Going all the way to the cross and beyond to give us an example of trusting our God, our creator to rescue, save, and redeem us from the underlying cause of struggle, which is sin. Yes, to to paint a picture of what it looks like to overcome and be sustained by the Spirit. Life is worth persevering because he persevered. Persevering, my friends, is holding on to the truth of Christ. It's showing the world what we're made of and whom our strength is found. Perseverance is not letting our circumstances or others drag down our attitude or positive outlook. Persevering is trying, trying, and trying, swimming and swimming and swimming. And when we have nothing left, trusting in God to be there to pick us up, to carry us, and to free us. So what has our Lord helped you persevere through? What do you need help persevering through now, today? Could be a long list. Could be losing a loved one. Know that grief is love persevering. Remember, God wants you. And whatever you come in with, whatever you log in with, your action for this element is prayer. Go home and think about lyrics from this hymn. Have you trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? You should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Amen. We'll close out with a quick song. If you commit to doing that, to taking it to God in prayer, stand and say, yes, I will.